So can I just welcome everybody? I think I know most on the call. Um, delighted to see uh, two members from the Bill and Ricky Rotary tonight. Um, I'm, for those I, ha I, I don't know on the call, I'm Gordon Morrison, President of Stork Valley Rotary. Now you'll all be familiar with Zoom housekeeping by now, but to remind you, you're all, the screens will be muted during the talk. There will be questions after the talk and I will do my best to scan the screens to raised hands. Um, and, and please wait to be unmuted before you speak. The chat box is probably the most reliable way of getting noticed. Um, we've got a fantastic attendance tonight and I think that just reflects the quality of the talk you're just about to hear. Um, now for those of you that have joined us previously, you'll be aware at the start of our meetings, I invite our most senior member, Peter Blaskus, <laughs> to give us his words of wisdom. Peter. Well, words of wisdom. A thought for today, anyway, yes. Good evening. Good day. May we give thanks for these evenings together and for isolation made better by fine spring weather. Gordon has worked wonders to keep us in touch with good lectures and discussions which matter so much. Dame Stella's subject tonight is called Dancing on Ice. Agreement between Mandarin and, Mandarin and Minister is never precise. Civil servants want to make sure that research is done. Politicians think action. Any action is better than none. Later, we may hear how to show tact, yet be sinister, by advising, that is a very courageous decision, Minister. You remember that? <laughs> well done. Well done, Peter. Very good. Now, very good. I made reference to Peter's seniority. I would just like to let you all know that Peter's 90th birthday is on Thursday of this week. So oh. best regards from us all, Peter, for that. <coughs> hey, well done. Very good health. I'm now very honored to introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Dame Stella Manzi. Stella has gained a reputation for turning around failing local authorities as chief executive. Although no longer directly involved in the managing of local authorities, she has continued as a devoted public servant and, as, and has as one of her current roles as chairman of the University Hospitals Coventry of Warwickshire. You, you obviously enjoy a real challenge, Stella. So tonight's talk is titled Dancing on Ice and I will now hand over to Stella. Thank you, Stella. Well, you're muted, hold on. I've got to unmute you. <laughs> I'll mute myself, how's that? Yeah, right, that's you unmuted now. That's great. Okay, um, well, first of all, good evening, everybody. It gives me a uh, great pleasure to to be here and as some of us were discussing beforehand I know some of you uh, knew my sadly deceased parents Gordon and Ross Manzi so I was very happy when Gordon Morrison approached me uh, and asked if I would do a talk uh, to to be involved and I thought it would be of some interest to give some insight into how and why uh, senior public servants work with politicians, a subject that I know is of some mystery to some people. I know many of you who are the audience, as it were, will have experience of this in different ways. So those of you that have, uh, forgive me, and you'll have to decide whether you think I'm uh, getting it right in, in my talk. Um, but as Gordon says, there will, be, there will be questions afterwards, so I'm sure we can explore some issues. So what am I basing this talk on. I'm basing it firstly on experience, my own, uh, my father's, other people's, but I am also basing it on uh, two reports which are proper research reports. I've, I've shown pictures of them on here. Uh, I haven't checked recently but I believe if any of you are interested afterwards, and I think they're both on the Open University Business School website actually, um, you'll see they both feature the words political astuteness, which I'll say a little bit more about in the presentation. But I know that we've got at least one person on the call from New Zealand. So the 
report that you can see on the left, um, leading with political astuteness, which was uh, dated 2013, is actually a study of public managers in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Um, and it is based on uh, surveys with over a thousand public servants, interviews with 42 others. And then the report on the right, Dancing on Ice, which I'll explain a little bit in a moment, is some research that I personally did with my academic writing partner, whose name you see at the top of the slide, Jean Hartley. And Jean is Professor of Public Leadership at the Open University Business School. And during 2012 and uh, a bit into 2013, I interviewed 17 senior public servants. About half of them were civil service permanent secretaries and about half of them uh, were local authority chief executives. And I interviewed them really about how they did their job, why they did their, jo their job, what sort of skills they thought they brought to bear on their job. And this report that you see before you is the outcome of that. I, of course, I of course, I'm not a real academic, if you know what I mean. I'm a practitioner, an experienced public servant who's worked in the civil service and in local government. But Jean, my partner, is a proper academic, as you can see, a professor. And what the two of us do is work together to bring our mutual experience, which hopefully brings some insights, which are both about practice and about the academic. So that's part of what's behind this, but of course, part of it is, is based on both myself and my father and other people's experience. So thank you very, thank you very much. So why dancing on ice? You must think, what on earth is she talking about here? Um, essentially, when we were doing this piece of work, we were looking for an image which encapsulated the slightly strange relationship between politicians and pub senior public servants who were, who were working with them. And the reason we uh, picked on Dancing on Ice uh, was because it's an interesting process where you've got two partners. It's quite delicate and precarious. Sometimes you may find the male half of the pairing is in the lead. Sometimes the female half of the pairing is in the lead. And if you look at the relationship between politicians and public servants, um, it's the politician generally in the ascendant. Occasionally that's not the case, but generally they're in the ascendant. And the public manager has to feel and breathe the political air and the objectives, if you like, but they both have to move together. They have to give each other space. Sometimes one is in the spotlight, sometimes the other. You'll sometimes find um, that uh, politicians are very much on the front and in the media. On other occasions, if you look at select committees or the public accounts committee or something like that, it may be the civil service who's under scrutiny. And of course, as we all witness in the media and have seen on different occasions over the years, sometimes, things go wrong and either one party or the other or sometimes both stumble and fall and there have been some recent uh, incidents uh, in, in the press as you see you've seen the recent uh, resignation of Philip Rutnam who was the permanent secretary in the home office for example that might be seen as an example um, of this of this kind of partnership going wrong obviously none of us can know exactly what has happened there but clearly it's something uh, that has come out uh, into, into the public domain. So why, why am I interested in this and who exactly are we talking about when we talk about senior public servants? So when I'm sort of talking in this, in this uh, presentation, I'm talking about civil servants. So for example, permanent secretaries, director generals, uh, directors who are kind of in the top echelons of the civil service or it could be council chief executives, whether it's Hertfordshire County Council, East Hertfordshire District Council, whether it's London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, where I used to work, or whether it's Sheffield City Council, who, whoever it might be. And of course, you also have heads of government advisors. Um, when I was preparing this, I added a bullet point on the basis of recent events, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but I did want to make the point that I'm not talking about special advisors. 
special advisors are a different breed. They are actually designated as temporary civil servants, but they are not true civil servants for obvious reasons. They're recruited for their political allegiance. They come through a different recruitment process. And although they're designated temporary civil servants, they ultimately report to the prime minister in a very different way from the broadband of, of civil servants uh, generally. Um, both my parents worked in the civil service. That's where they met. Uh, my father, Sir Gordon Mansley, became a permanent secretary. Uh, my mother, as was the way of the world in those days, um, stopped working uh, when, when she had me and, at me and my brother. Although my father would point out that in the entrance exams to the civil service, my mother in her year actually did better than my father in his year in entering the civil service. But actually that was, that was uh, the, the way the world worked at the time. And obviously I'm interested in this because of my own work as a council chief executive in various places, such as Coventry, West Berkshire, London Borough, Barking, Dagenham, but also because I, ha I had the very interesting role as a director general in the civil service in Scotland. And although we have got devolved government, the UK civil service is still a single entity. So although I was in Scotland, I was still part of the UK civil service and the whole UK civil service, the senior managers used to meet together at intervals, say at three, say three or four times, uh, times a year. So for those who don't know, it's worth just looking at the background of senior public servants and what it is that brings them into uh, working with, with politicians overall. Now, of course, it varies enormously. If you look at um, senior civil servants, uh, their degrees and backgrounds uh, are over a range of subjects. Some of you may have seen surveys that show that they may disproportionately be in the direction of arts subjects. That is gradually changing. I'm afraid I do bear out that stereotype. I did have an English degree from Cambridge and a master's in social sciences from Birmingham. But if you look at the current cabinet secretary, for example, Mark Sedwell, his first degree was as a bachelor of science from St. Andrews. So the great Scottish network, although I don't think he's Scottish, uh, the great Scot Scottish education system uh, still uh, comes, comes to the fore. Um, some, of course, are employed as technical experts. They might be employed as economists or scientists or lawyers, which is not quite the same as the people who are in the sort of general policy domain. If you look at local government, so the people who are looking after your local services, they will vary and they will come in from different backgrounds. Some of them will have been in general management and policy, like me. Others will have come in from town planning, social care, accountancy, whatever. So again, it, it varies. There isn't, a there isn't a rule. It used to be the case that it was always lawyers, if you looked at, say, 40 years ago. But that's not the case nowadays. People come in from, from a variety of, of backgrounds. So what do I think are the key issues in relation of... Um, public servants working together with politicians. There are some very important factors which I'm going to uh, talk about, um, but it's important to say that when senior public service managers are interviewed, both in the personal interviews I did or in surveys and so on, they strongly emphasize integrity and ethics and the ability to work with people from different political backgrounds. And if I say that in my public service career, I have worked uh, with Conservatives, uh, Labour, uh, Liberal Democrats and the Scottish National Party. Um, obviously, I have my own political views, but they do not come into play when I'm in, in my professional arena. I'm doing my damnedest to help deliver whatever political persuasion it is wants to do. Um, you know, uh, within, within, their own, within, within their own manifesto. And so those public servants, um, they have to be politically astute, and I'll say a bit more about this phrase, and they must be able to operate in a way in a dual world. On the one hand, they're working with their politicians who will have their own views about this and that. On the other, they have got to be professionally competent at their public 
servant role. And I'll say a little bit more about, about what that means. But it's interesting that uh, Peter, in his initial, initial uh, of amusing uh, verse, referred back to Yes Minister. And all of us are old enough here to remember when um, Yes Minister uh, was at its tight on TV. Um, and so I've put up pictures here, both of Yes Minister and the more recent TV production of um, The Thick of It. And I, I suppose what I wanted to say is that actually life as a public servant is not really much like either of these two caricatures. It's, they are both very funny, very effective programs. And in Yes Minister, one of the funniest programs I've ever seen is when Jim Hacker, um, uh, sorry, uh, when uh, the Permanent Secretary explains to Jim, Sa Jim Hacker why it is impossible to have women senior civil servants, which I think in the course of it, he tries to designate as Satsumas, to go with the Mandarins, as it were. And I have often used quotations from the program when I've been talking about women and careers, and it is extremely funny. But what I would argue with in the characterization is the kind of manipulation uh, that Sir Humphrey uh, uses, which is a fantastic caricature, but I would argue that most civil servants would not get very far if they tried that degree of manipulation. And if you look at the thick of it, which is also a very funny and entertaining program, most of the people you see in the thick of it are not civil servants. They are people um, like Malcolm Tucker, the director of communications, who is a, a political appointment, a bit like Alistair Campbell was under the, in the Blair administration. What is interesting in the thick of it is that the small number of actual civil servants you see, like Terry in this picture played by Joanna Scanlon, are generally depicted to be pretty useless and incompetent. Um, and, that's, and that's how they're uh, depicted uh, in, in that overall. So I suppose having said, said a bit about the background to public servants and a bit about perhaps what they aren't, which we can get into a bit later maybe, it's worth saying a little bit about how public servants perceive what they do with politicians. Then I'll talk a little bit about the sort of basic tasks and some of that. So public, senior public servants themselves explain what they do by saying things like, and these are direct quotes, you are genuinely enabling politicians to reach a view on what they want to do and, you, and they allow you, i.e. the politicians allow you to help them find how they want to do it. And one of the observations um, I would make is that sometimes politicians themselves do not know exactly what, what they want to do, even if they've put some things in a manifesto. They may say what the outcome is that they want to achieve, but they don't always know exactly how they want to achieve it. Sometimes they do. Sometimes you've got people who've got a very clear picture and they say, no, I want to get to this point. I want to do it by this way. And I want you, um, permanent secretary or chief executive or whatever, to help me get there, basically. How are we going to do it? In other cases, they're saying, this is where I want to get to. This is what I want to achieve for the public or for business or whatever it happens to be. And I need some advice and some raw material about the possible ways in which we could achieve it so that we, so that we can discuss that. Other definitions, as you can see on the slide, is it's the conversion of dialogue for political or public purposes into managerial solutions. And it's also talked about as shared leadership. There's the leadership of the politician and the leadership of the public servant, although the politician is always more on the front foot in that. But it has to be about professional advice. It's got to be competent, it's got to be knowledgeable, but it's also got to be politically aware. Um, similarly, people talk about trying to back up a full range of decisions. It's not about public servants saying, this is the only thing you can do, this is what you should do. It's about offering options. And most senior public servants, maybe not all, but most recognize the kind of stresses and strains that politicians are under. They are not only thinking about the job they're doing with the civil service, they're thinking about their constituency party, 
they're thinking about the political objectives of their party, they're thinking about the next election, and a whole range of things. They're not just thinking about their ministerial role or their council cabinet role, whatever it happens to be. And as it says on this slide, they're having to account to a whole number of political audiences. And a couple of the people who I interviewed described themselves as kind of translators in a way. You know, politicians say, I've got these ideas, this, that, or the other that I want to do. And often it is the civil service or council official task to translate that into action. How are we actually going to make that happen? What are the obstacles going to be? How are we going to overcome them? And, and, and what are we going to do? So moving to the basics of what senior public servants do, because I think most people can understand, you know, town planner, they're obviously giving planning advice or whatever, or whatever it happens to be. But I think when you get to the senior levels, when people are working closely with, with politicians all the time, I think sometimes uh, people have quite a hazy view of exactly what that means. And I don't really blame them because sometimes it's not easy to, to explain. But the obvious things I suppose are on this slide. Clearly, sometimes people are helping politicians produce government or council policies on strategic issues. So whether it's the budget or immigration or devolution or the economy or education, whatever it happens to be, it's kind of high level policy. What are we going to say? How are we going to tackle inequalities, for example? Uh, so in Gordon Brown's time as prime minister, there was a big agenda about trying to reduce child poverty and what kind of mechanisms were the government going to use to do that? Obviously, in, under different political persuasions, there are, there are different agendas. You're sometimes working on very detailed legislation, and there might be a bill team who are working on a bill. You'll, you'll have a lead civil servant who's working on the policy with the minister. You'll obviously have legal officers who are doing that. Other people who are liaising with parliamentary officers, a whole range of other things. Sometimes people aren't working on the legislation, they're working on delivering that legislation. Is it going to place, are local authorities doing what they were originally intended to do? Are schools doing what the intention was? Is business responding in the, in, in the right way? Is it having the right impact on exports? Whatever, whatever it happens to be. And of course, some major bits of the civil service actually deliver services all the time. So if you looked at the Department of Work and Pensions, job centers and that kind of thing, if you looked at the Ministry of Defense, where they're working with the Army, the Navy, uh, the, the Royal Air Force and so on, they are clearly doing heavy duty delivery jobs. And often what they're doing is liaising, if it say it's the MOD with generals or whoever, and the Secretary of State Defense for Defense. And clearly, council services that most people are familiar with to some degree. If you looked at Hertfordshire County Council, they're looking at strategic transport, they're looking at social care, they're looking at education, all of these kinds of things, but they're trying to make them meld together so that they are achieving the political objectives of the councillors in the county council. And if you looked at East Hertfordshire, they're doing, you know, your bins, your housing, they're, even if they're not directly providing the housing, housing, they've got a strategic housing responsibility and they're trying to work with the county council in order to deliver those things. And then slightly ironically on the end of this slide, the other thing that you're doing as a senior, senior public servant is working on crises of one sort or another, of which clearly COVID-19 is, is a prime example. Um, in my time in the Scottish government, uh, I was working on things like um, weather crisis, snow, snow related crises, if you like. Um, there was the when the Icelandic volcano uh, erupted and kind of everything stopped in Europe, for example. Uh, you know, what was the Scottish government doing in relation to those kinds of things? So obviously there are a whole range of things. I have to say, I think we all appreciate that the current crisis is very different um, from those that have gone before, simply because of the complexity of it, the length of time it's going to last, all, all of those um, kind, of, kind of things. So just to say a little bit more about political astuteness, which is this quality, if you like, that I'm saying that senior public servants need to have. And I need to be clear that it's not 
party political affiliation. It's political astuteness, which is a very different thing. Um, so on this slide, uh, there's obviously a number of phrases um, that, that might uh, equate to this or be part of this. Metis in the middle, for those people who are not Greek students, I've had to look this up myself in the past, um, is all about wisdom. The goddess Metis, who was Zeus's first wife and the mother of Athena, was the goddess of uh, wisdom overall. Um, so you've got all of these things that political astuteness is made, of, made up of. Some people would call it political nous, some people would call it political acumen, awareness, whatever you like to describe it. But essentially, it's the quality that means you can look at a subject through several lenses. You can look at the practicalities of it. Uh, you can look at what the politician is likely to be thinking about it. So your advice that you might give to that politician has to be predicated on your knowledge and understanding of where that politician is politically, what they've stated in that, that manifesto, and what they're likely to think. And I would say, actually, and I'm sure many of you realize this, that it's not even as simple as saying what one political party means or thinks. Because I would say to you that conservative politicians in Coventry City Council are not necessarily the same in their views as conservative politicians in Surrey County Council, because they're in very different areas. They've got political, they've got different political dynamics going on. So what they think about things are not necessarily going to be the same, even though they are members of the same political party. And it's this quality of political astuteness that the research I've been involved in and discussions I've been involved in uh, is very important to the skills and abilities, if you like, of, of senior public servants. What does it make up? I mean, the, the research uh, reports that I mentioned go into this in more detail, but essentially there are about five different dimensions summed up in the first four bullet points about personal, interpersonal and interpersonal skills, being able to read people and situations, the sort of thing that all of you in your business and other environments, whether it's the PTA or a board meeting or a church meeting, whatever it is, you know that you look around a room and you can see how people are interacting with, it, other, with each other. Obviously that's in a normal non-COVID situation. It's about building alignment and, and alliances, you know, um, who, who are going to be the people who are in favor of what you're saying, who are the people who are going to be against. And it's thinking about what that means for the politician, it's about strategic direction and scanning. And it's also, in addition to those things I've mentioned, at the bottom, we've listed knowledge. So if you're a public servant, you've got to know how the processes work. If you're in the civil service, how do you get that legislation produced? How does it go through parliament? All those kinds of things. If you're in a council, it's how are we going to get that through cabinet? How does the planning process work? Whatever it happens to be. You've got to exercise judgment. You've got different skills. And above all, you've got to look at the context. In my own life, I've worked as chief executive of West Berkshire Council when I was, that's a unitary council, obviously part of Berkshire. When I was there, it was controlled by the Liberal Democrats. You know, what they thought in, in, a count, in, a, in an authority like West Berkshire is clearly completely different from what a Labour controlled council, say Coventry City Council, thought when I worked for them. When I was in Coventry, I worked for both Labour and Conservatives because the control changed when, when I was there. But above all else, you've got to be able to have a code of ethics. And this is very, very important. So the fact, for, exam for example, that I retained my job when the council control changed from Labour to Conservative uh, in, during my time in Coventry, uh, hopefully was an indication that the incoming Conservatives trusted the fact that I would work as hard for them to deliver their policies as I had for the Labour group to deliver their policies when, when Labour uh, were in. And that means you've got to be very, very transparent in what you're saying. You've not got to disclose confidences that have been shared with you by one group with another group unless you've agreed that 
or for some reason it's in the public interest and in that case you would be disclosing that to the various political elements. So coming back to some of these key, com key components, ethics I've, I've just touched on, acting with integrity and, and commitment to non-partisan advice, and then this third bullet point, I just need to explain a little bit, clearly differentiating between technical advice and what I've called values-based advice. The sort of thing I mean is this, if either the government or a council, let's say there's a politician who decides they want to build a bridge. There's a whole range of layers of advice that come into that. So first of all, there's the very obvious couple of things. Number one, does the engineer say that it's possible to build the bridge? Is it physically possible to build it on that site? Second question, is it physically possible to build it within a cost envelope? Or is it going to be the most expensive bridge on the planet? And clearly you'll be looking from your quantities of air, your accountants, your engineer at those costings but then you get into some of the more values-based advice. Some of that is, is it the right thing to do to build that bridge? Or is a politician, for example, just building it because he wants to meet a certain constituency's requirements or even at a very local level, ward requirements? You know, what's the demand for bridges in other parts of the county or in other parts of the country? And then, of course, you get into the advice, which is, is this bridge going to be very controversial to build? Are the local community or indeed the city or whoever against it or for it? Who's going to try and block it? Are there going to be demonstrations against it? Is there going to be some kind of legal challenge? If you as a politician want to overcome that, who are you going to have to get on board? Are you going to try and get the local business community on board? Or is it about getting local activists, maybe environmental activists, because it's going to take traffic away from some beauty spot because you put the, the, put the um, bridge, it and bridge in? And who are you going to engage in terms of your allies? So in these kinds of discussions, you're thinking on many different levels at once. Now, clearly, many business people are also thinking on those same different levels. But the difference is in a public sphere is that a lot of that will be exposed to issues of transparency. You've got to justify it in a public forum. You may have journalists crawling all over you morning, noon and night, asking awkward questions to the politician, all those kinds of things. So you've got to be very, very transparent. And that brings me to the penultimate bullet point, which is connecting your public actions to a recognizable framework of principles. Clearly, that means very obvious things like there's not got to be corruption involved, you know, and less obvious things like what are the principles we're applying to this decision that the, that the politician is, is trying to take forward. And you're always trying to think about what is the public interest. Like, for example, if such and such is going to be controversial, then actually it's very important that you share information about that transparently with people and that you don't try and conceal it in a clandestine, in a clandestine uh, kind of way. So moving towards the, the, the close of the talk, not quite there, but nearly there. Um, so what are the, the key points really in all of this? First of all, it's very important that people understand what it is senior public managers are doing or not doing. They are not uh, manipulating, they are using political astuteness. And of course, they present information and anybody who presents information can do it one way or do it another way but they've got an ethical responsibility to present that information in a balanced way. And one of the interesting things it mentions in one of the reports is one of the things, uh, of course, is that no politician is the same. Politicians are human beings like the rest of us. They've got a range of um, different characteristics which we observe in, in the media. And if you're working with, say, an incoming minister, You've got to work out what their thinking style is. How do they like their information presented? And when I interviewed some of these permanent secretaries, some of them described working with one minister, 
who preferred you to come with ideas and then have a very exploratory conversation around those ideas and another minister who was very, very clear about what they wanted. They wanted X, they wanted Y, they wanted Z, and they wanted a plan which was going to explain how to deliver them and what the, what the problems are. So different people, much as in any line of business, have got different approaches and you then got to kind of work out how, how they want, want to work. But I think the key thing to say is that some people might think political astuteness is a malevolent thing, you know, a bit like Machiavelli or something, but actually, it is a positive thing which people need to have in order to play a role in democratic governance and clearly politicians are part of democratic governance but in a well-run uh, country and of course we can debate about all our countries in the world about how well run or otherwise they are but if you want democratic governance you have to have effective politicians and effective public service and i have to say Whatever, whatever one may think about public services in the country, they are some of the least corrupt in the world, and they would certainly rank in the kind of more effective category as opposed to the less effective uh, category, e even on, I am absolutely not saying they're perfect, don't get me wrong. So, as I've been saying, this is what brings you back to the fact that politicians and senior public servants have to work together in balance when it's working well, hence the Dancing on Ice title. And public servants have to have this combination that I've talked about of political astuteness, managerial skills, institutional knowledge, and kind of ethical judgment. And I'm going to finish my talk by really asking, so why do public servants do it? What are the motivating features? And I am going to feature for those people that knew him, one or two of you knew I am, I am going to feature a picture of my father at this uh, closing juncture. Um, this is my father uh, welcoming Her Majesty the Queen and the then Secretary of State Nicholas Ridley, who is also deceased now, uh, to the opening of the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre in Westminster in 1986. I'm sure many of you will have seen it from afar, um, just adjacent to Parliament Square. It was the Property Services Agency that built uh, the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre. Um, so this is my father uh, welcoming her to the centre. And along, uh, uh, down the left, you can see, so why do people do it? And I can vouch for this myself, having uh, made a career in, in public service. Above all, it's dead interesting. It's really fascinating. It is rarely dull. That's not to say that you don't have the odd dull meeting. But if you look at the overall, it is completely fascinating. And if you're interested in politics at all, and actually like and have a high regard for politicians, as I do, I see them as a force for good. That doesn't mean to say I've liked every single politician I've ever met. But predominantly, I do see them as a force for good. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a belief in that democratic system. You do believe that you're seeking to improve quality of life. Again, as I said earlier, it doesn't mean to say that every single thing is done by government, by government is a good thing, but predominantly people are trying to Im improve quality of life or, or prevent destruction or whatever it happens to be. And of course, there is the ethos of public service. There is a particular ethos around that. I'm not saying there aren't people who transgress um, you know, in, in one of the places I, I worked, uh, we had to prosecute somebody who was stealing from vulnerable people. So I'm not saying that every public servant in the world is a perfect human being. Of course, they're not. There are bad apples in, in every barrel. But overall, there are large numbers of people who are working very positively within the ethos of public service and, and what it means. Um, and, and therefore, that's really um, why people do it. So I will finish there and say I'm very happy to take questions, either very macro questions or very micro questions. Stella, thank you very much. What a wonderful insight into a world that we all read about but didn't really understand.